Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. My name's Dan, this is Exploder, and I'm here with another episode just for you. Lately, we've all been stuck in the house, let's call it what it is. Recently, uh, The Gromy Show did a live uh, stream presentation of The Gromy Show. We should have had a show that night, but we've all been stuck in the house for weeks now. And that also applies to the pro wrestling business. So in honor of WrestleMania of the Caribbean, turning into some empty building pre-tape, some of the roster missing clusterfuck, I've decided to do an episode about other disasters that have happened in pro wrestling. Now, I've done ones on death, I've done ones on bad pay-per-views, and this show isn't necessarily about bad pay-per-views, it's about things that have happened that have been disastrous to the pay-per-view, to the fans, to the production as a whole. So I'm not necessarily talking about bad pay-per-views as much as I'm talking about disastrous productions. Now, way back in one of the first episodes of the show, I did a whole episode on WCW sold out 2000, which was, to my estimation, the second worst pay-per-view of all time. The one with too many matches, a world champion that held the belt for less than 24 hours before leaving the company, and one match ending because one guy forgot the rules. So because I've talked about that one, I'm not going to talk about that. And again, it was a bad show, but production-wise, it was okay. In this episode, I'm going to talk about other showcases of shit, where the audiences had to live through things that just they shouldn't have. So buckle up. So I'm starting with the considering that WrestleMania is coming up, a two-night event in an empty building where some of the roster's not even going to show up because they can't or don't want to, or some of them are Goldberg. When you go back through WrestleManias, there are bad WrestleManias. Uh, WrestleMania 11, not the greatest. When your main event involves Bam Bam Bigelow and a drug addict, not great. WrestleMania 9 uh, was a different feel, but the, it ended with Hogan winning the belt yet again. The waning days of Hulkamania. I could even talk about WrestleMania 4, which was a tournament that had way too many matches, way too way too little intrigue, and just wasn't that good. But in this case, I want to talk about when we talk about production, I want to talk about disasters. You have to talk about WrestleMania 2. On the heels of WrestleMania 1, the original WrestleMania, everything was great. It was it was just amazing. They had stars, they had Mr. T and Liberace and Billy Martin and Cindy Lauper and you had all these celebrities and it was a big event. So I decided for the next year, for WrestleMania 2, they were going to make it even bigger. And in this case, that meant they were going to do three separate shows in three separate venues and put them all together to make one giant show. Which already sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, and it kind of was. Each show would have a, a card, each show would have their own, their own main event, and then they would go to the next one. And what happened was, production-wise, what made it a disaster was... While each venue had their own uh, main event, the problem was if you weren't in the other arena, you basically watched the show on a screen. So what would happen was your show would happen, say Chicago, where they had the NFL Battle Royal with Frederick Perry, many uh, members of the Chicago Bears, uh, NFL players and things like that. And then your that'd be your main event, and then your main event would be done. And then they would lower large screens, and then you'd watch the other two venues from a screen so you'd go to an arena see part of a show and then watch the rest like a giant movie theater which is fine i guess if that's what you want to do but it just production wise it didn't there's a reason why the wf as big as it ever got as big as it ever got especially during the attitude era never did this again because quite frankly it just sounds like a nightmare it's something that worked out somehow but it wasn't good and it was it was enough that where they could ride the momentum of hulkamania and go into the silver dome and uh, wrestlemania three in 1987 and did really well with it but there's a reason why what they did in wrestlemania 2 they never did again because there's just so many working parts there and any one of them could have gone bad any one of them could have could have screwed up and they would have had a nightmare on their hands both live and on pay-per-view and of course you can't talk about production disasters or bad pay-per-views in general without talking about the great american bash 1991 now there have been a lot of bad or eh, great American bashes over the years. They had a lot of them. It used to be two or three days on a weekend, you know what I mean? But the 1991 version was just... I don't even know how to explain the 1991 version. 1991 Great American Bash opened with PN News, Bobby Eaton, Steve Austin, and Terry Taylor competing in a tag team scaffold match. I don't know what... First of all, one of those guys is PN News, which... Him standing on the middle rope was like way too high for a guy that size. And they're going to put him on a scaffolding? Are you out of your damn mind? The match went 10 minutes and it should have gone zero minutes because that's a dumb idea. It was one of those things what WCW would do sometimes, even back in the early 90s. They would just do stuff to do it, even if it made no sense. Oh, we got the scaffold. So they just do a scaffold match, even though it featured PN News. 
The other problem, now this is, again, that's sort of an example of a bad match, but let's talk about production, stuff behind the scenes, machinations that are not necessarily about the wrestling, but just things that just don't go well. You know what's really significant about the Great American Bash? Ric Flair left the company with the title belt two weeks before this event. Yeah, that's right. Jim Hurd, who wanted Ric Flair to cut his hair and rename himself Spartacus, and Ric Flair, for some reason, didn't like that idea, decided to leave the company and join the WWF, taking the title with him because he had physical ownership of it. This left WWE without a top, not only a top star, but without a champion. So this created a loop, a hole for Lex Luger and Barry Windham to put together into a WWE championship match to fill the vacancy. Barry Windham was a mid-card guy at best, wasn't anywhere near Ric Flair's level, although they were trying to build him. And the other guy, the guy expected to be the star to carry the match, was Lex Luger. So it didn't matter who won. And then on top of that, at the end of it, Lex Luger turned heel, which the crowd didn't care about, because at the end of the, day, end of the night, all they were doing was chanting, We Want Flair, which you can't blame them. Other people in the card didn't help. We're talking about Ellie Gante faced the one-man gang. Okay, I don't. that sounds like a modern classic. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were still Oz and the Diamond Stud for some reason. And Ricky Morton faced Robert Gibson. Now, that sounds like on, on paper, that sounds like a good match. Those two guys who were always against each other, always tag teaming that, like, oh, it'd be a great match. It was dull. It just wasn't great. So you take a couple bad matches, or meh matches, throw in PN News on a scaffold for some damn reason. Your main event is falling apart. And oh, by the way, you let the world champion go two weeks before the com before this show. How is that not going to be disastrous? The answer is, there's no way it's not going to be disastrous, and it was. All right, everybody. Uh, before I did this, I got my wife, who knows nothing about pro wrestling, almost next to nothing, and I got her to guess some questions, and she came with things like Sparkly Pimp Man, Sparkly <laughs> Trooper, and Jerry the King Wrestler. Now! I thought that, I thought, right. No, right. you got it wrong at first. But now, I have another ten. Uh, she does not know who they are. She does not know what the names are. And I'm going to show her 10 people, and she's going to guess her names, and we're going to have a little fun with it. So how's that sound? Yep. Wow. She's a <laughs> woman of so many words. All right, here's our first one. Dragon wrestler. You think everyone's like Mr. Man or Dragon I, I or Wrestler? Say, you think wrestlers and everything? I wanted everything? to say Dragon Man, Dragonfly Man. Dragonfly Man? I don't he looks like a dragon. Yeah, that's yeah. I get that Is part. Is it something with dragon? Yes. Okay. But not dragonfly man. Okay. Well, I didn't say that at first. I said <laughs> dragon wrestler, and then you criticized it, so I changed my answer. Okay. Dragon. You just call him the dragon. dragon. The dragon. The dragon. You're partially right. He is Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. <laughs> How the hell? Once uh, again, hey, where... Hey, hey, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's what we're doing, okay? Oh my god, this makes no this sense. This is the first one, so you might want to calm the hell down. This makes no sense. I don't, right, I don't care. Who is this lovely chap? The Phantom. The Phantom. Of wrestling. The Phantom of wrestling, you say? Mm -hmm. mm. Am I close? I was close. No, not really. What? One more. The... the is involved. The something. Okay, the demon. You're absolutely right. He is the demon. Yes. <laughs> yes, he is the demon based on Gene Simmons from Kiss. I wondered. Yeah, that was the whole thing. WWE did wondered. some strange shit back then. I mean, that makes more sense than the other one, I guess. It truly the does. Dragon. Yeah, kind of. the dragon. Yes. This lovely gentleman. Oh, yeah, you're not going to get this one. I'm straight up telling you, you ain't going to get it. Somebody proposed this costume. And oh, yeah. Like, yeah. He wore it. Sounds great. And he wore it. And he would is, eat food on his way to the ring. Is it the baby? Nope, not at all. The big fat baby. No. The fat man. <laughs> no, these are all fat man. these are descriptors, but not the answer. No. The fat wrestler. The fat wrestler. No, <laughs> his name is Bastion Booger. Oh hey, I don't make God. the rule. I don't make these. I just report them. Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh my God. Just let that sink in. I can't. You can, this and you will. Ridiculous. This gentleman, I'll give you. I'll give you if you get his first name. You don't have to know the whole name. If you get his first name, I'll give it to you. Uh, I'm trying to think of what those people are called, like from Africa. Okay, you're on the track with Africa, but what's the name? What's his name? His real name? What's the name of the character? Oh, well, Simon. Simon. Oh, no. For those of you keeping track, she just looked at this and said, "Simon." <laughs> Yeah, hey, well, Simon, the guy from Africa. Simon. I'm trying to think of, like a tribal leader guy. He's definitely not African. I feel like he is not. Kind of that's part of the. That, well, it, it, it was the 80s. Um, it's part of weird. It's weird. I feel like you're setting us up to get really like hate mail. No, this is a real gimmick. I I didn't make this up. I'm simply like, like I said, if you get the first name right, I'd, I'd give you the whole thing if you just got the first so name his, right. So his name is in it. It's his name, and then there's like a nickname behind it. I don't expect you to know the nickname. Kevin. It's long, Kevin. 
Simon and Kevin are the options so far. I don't know. I'll give you one more. Uh, Jim. Jim. <laughs> so it's Simon, Kevin, and Jim. No. I feel like Simon's really not in it, though. No, none of those are in it. Okay. This is Akeem the African Dream. Yeah, I know. We're going to get so much hate. <laughs> we heard, that's his name. That's his name. This was from the 80s. I do not, I do not support this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's past. It's over. Okay, no one cares well, anymore. I would not support it back then. There we go. The Irishman. Closer. The drunk Irishman. Not drunk. The drunk Irish wrestler man. Okay, now we're going to start getting hate mail. Um, <laughs> no. No. The Irish. He looks like a what? I'll, I'll give you a hint on this one. Irishman? You think all Irish people dress like that? On, on St. Patty's Day, He yeah, dressed like that all the time. Just in the ring, though. He's Irish. What does he look like? An angry man. There's a, there's a clear one you're missing. Redhead? I don't know. Try again. The what is it? It's a stereotype. What is this stereotype of an Irish person? What's Drunk. the stereotype? Beyond that. He may have been drunk when he agreed to this, but that's not the point. Gold? I don't know. Gold. Small? This is Braun the Leprechaun. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you ask me about the dude on Lucky Charms? Oh, wait, wait, no, that's way too obvious. I can't be doing that. Jeez. <laughs> He doesn't look like a leprechaun. Yeah, he was a short man who wrestled. His name was Braun the Leprechaun. First of all, I cannot see how tall he is. Well, he was okay. short, trust me. Well, you should have put him next to another wrestler. Oh, I'm though. sorry. I, I'm sorry. Let me go back in my fucking time machine and find all these these particular pictures of somebody from 1995. Okay, that's fine. I'll wait. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Well, then don't I have not mastered it. time travel. Then don't Try again. It. Who's this son of a bitch? Oh, hell. Yeah. Oh, you're not going to get this one. Zebra. Try again. Zebra wrestler. Z, Z is a good start. Z. Z. It starts with a Z. Z. Yeah. Zebra man. Not zebra man. Z the... What's those fringy things? Is that part that's of it? Just, yeah, that's just his thing. He just has shit hanging from his arms. Uh, Z is a good start. Z what? Z. How many words start with Z? Zombie? Z the zombie? No, nope. try again. I'm just getting zombie and zebra. That's pretty much what I'm getting That's a Zombie or zebra? No. He is the other Z. He is Zodiac. Why don't you say his name after a killer? I, I, again, I can't give it to you. If you're going to give me hints. It's a Z. There's only like three words. First of all, I would have never guess Zodiac from that. Well, I well, no one else did either, but it was a thing. He he later became the booty man. Yeah, there's a whole history oh, here. I, I could can't. do what I could do ones of just this guy, yeah, but I, I'll save you that one. All right, uh, here is number seven. The biker. No. I feel like I was close. Could you I'll give like, you a hand. It's a number. Oh, for fuck's He's sake. named after a number. Is it the the something? The something? Mm -mm. Nope, just the number. Is it biker or something? Nope, no biker, just no the number. Biker. Uh, He's a phone number. Phone number. A phone number. Like the whole thing. When I say it, you'll you'll uh, you'll get it. It's very oh, obvious. Like the eight six seven five three or nine thing. No, he is not. He is not Tommy Two Tone. No. Well, you said the phone number. Yeah, one. Guy, it's the guy's name. And it's a phone number. It's so odd. When you it hear it, you'll know. Number. When you hear it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Just think of any short phone number you know. It's either mine or that one I just said. You think his name is your phone no, number? No, it's all the numbers I know. <laughs> I'm not a so, goddamn phone book. This wrestler in ECW back in the mid 90s <laughs> was named after my <laughs> wife's future cell phone number. That is how good Paul Heyman was. No, he is 911. Oh, for, oh my God. I told you when I said it, you'd get it. I told okay, you. Once again, you could have said, hey, you worked at a place where they have a phone number. Oh, come again. Well, if, uh, hell, if I could give you all the answers, shit. I gave you a phone number, and you're like, my phone number? Like, well, that's... that's... Those are the only two numbers uh, I know right off the top of oh my head. Oh, my God. All right. And I guess Nanny's phone number, maybe? Here's or... one. I'll give you if you get his first name. Ken. Nope. Barbie. Barbie. You think his name is he Barbie. He looks like a Ken doll. Look at that hair. First then all, what that makes him a Barbie? Is luscious. It, it is luscious. It was, luscious. It's still very is long. Is it luscious? It still is. No, I mean, like, is his wrestling No, name his luscious? name's not Luscious, no. Luscious hair. No, that's not a name, no. Mr. Perfect. Is it Mr. Perfect? There is a Mr. Perfect, but it ain't him. But, Mr. Perfect. But it is not him, no. Uh, Again, I'll give you, if you give it, he has a regular first name. If you get his uh, first name, I'll give it to you. Jesus. He looks like a Mark. He's not a Mark. Uh, Tim? Nope. Uh, Starts with a G. Gerald? Nope. Nope. Hard. You get one more. Uh, <laughs> Gaston? Gaston. <laughs> You just gassed on. No. His what? Name is, Gaston was good looking in that movie. His name is Greg. Greg the Hammer Valentine. Okay, where the fuck? I said I'd give you... First of all, he's the son of Johnny Valentine, who was also a wrestler. So the last name Where'd is... Where'd the hammer come into? He, they call him the hammer. Is he... First of all, we don't ask that <laughs> shit here. No, it's... No, it's because he hits hard, you weirdo. This isn't porn. God. What do you think this show's about? I don't know... 
I've seen some pretty sketchy people on here so far. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> He All like right. whips it out. He's like, it's Hammer Time. All right. This hey, is, it's your people. It is my people. This is the tag team. I don't even need their individual <laughs> name. What's the name of the tag team? Oh, f- name of the group. I don't even need the individual. Just the name of the group. The Biker Brothers. No. The Bootylicious Boys. Why would anyone be named that? <laughs> I don't look at his butt. Look at that guy's butt. One more. <laughs> The Beatdown Bros. No, they are Demolition. I feel like I was close. No, you were not. But Bootylicious Boys was nowhere close to Demolition. <laughs> I feel like someone in that group should come and kick your ass for that. That's not... Nice. <laughs> First of all, that mm. one guy, he's got a nice little butt going. He's a bigger it? guy, but that don't mean shit. Okay, it's not... Like, all like, right. Boom, 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 oh. booties, booties. <laughs> I hope Bill Eady is pissed at you right now. All right. Is he still alive? Yes, two of them are. Oh, which one's dead? The one in the middle. That's Brian sad. Adams Where passed away. from? remember oh, come on i gotta know this stuff i, I gotta know back i'm giving you all this information <sighs> all right moving on jesus this is the last one power ranger man and power ranger man is not an option no he looks like he belongs the power rangers yeah maybe you could argue it but it's not like not, not the name. head part but the definitely the, the body suit part. yeah, yeah maybe sure. yeah, i don't know pretty sure that was a bad he just re- costume he just recently retired and i would know who that is i'm this part of the game actually i don't want to tell you have i gotten anybody right so far i don't think you have oh, i think this has been a no for 10 situation well i would did better than the last one you did better last time you did about uh, you did about four and a half last time this time the, i honestly i'm not the sam no not the samurai the what's those things anime anime man Anime, anime man. Yeah. Anime person. I don't know. Being anime totally wrestler. Correct. His name is Jushin Thunder Liger. <sighs> anime person. All right. I don't know. I'm starting to I think know you don't. Crap. I know you don't know, but that's the fun of the game. I'm just saying. Okay. This is ridiculous. The last one you said bootylicious boys. So I, I, I didn't <laughs> feel like you're trying at that point. <laughs> no, for them I had no idea. You're just saying words. I, I got just, I look at them and I just give uh, them names based on their description. The hedgehog twins. Just like you're saying <laughs> words. <laughs> First of all, that would make no sense whatsoever. Oh, that would make no sense. The booty lish, the booty licious boys make sense to you. Three of them. Okay. All right. Well, that's gonna do it for this time. Um, (laughs) I'm gonna get another list at some point and show this because I this has to continue. Uh, But until next time, let's get back to the show. And then there's some things you just can't plan for. Quite frankly, as bad as it's been. As bad as this, you know, WrestleMania this year, the Lymph of Pirate theme, which is sort of weird because, you know, considering everyone's getting disease and stuck in small buildings, the point is, it, you can't control some things that happen. These things happen. Sometimes there's pandemic, sometimes there's a power outage, or sometimes there's a natural disaster. And I don't mean the tag team, I mean an actual natural disaster. That's what happened in In Your House Beware of Dog in 1996. This was held in South Carolina, which during the show was hit by a severe thunderstorm. Two matches aired on the pay-per-view before power went out in the entire building. The rest of the show continued live in front of the crowd under the emergency light system, but the pay-per-view feed just went out. It was replaced by dark matches and things like that, but the actual pay-per-view just cut off. The live crowd saw the rest of the pay-per-view for what it was in partial darkness, and it went through, and by all accounts, some of the matches were actually pretty good. Not that you'd be able to see a whole lot. They would then reschedule the pay-per-view two days later, also in South Carolina, and then they would cobble both shows into a Frankenstein of pro wrestling. The two-part show would feature Steve Austin and Savio Vega in a Caribbean strap match, which was, by the way, Ted DiBiase's last appearance in the WWF before leaving to join the NWO because he needs money. And the main event was between Shawn Michaels and the British Bulldog Dave Boy Smith, which was a culmination of a feud between... Uh, between the ladies' man Shawn Michaels, who was falsely accused of hitting on Smith's wife Diana, which he de- which he denied, that was basically the whole angle. And the match wasn't that good. They did the old uh, German suplex, both shoulders down, two referees finish, and it also fell flat. So you take the idea of a lackluster main event uh, and the wrath of God, and you made this one disastrous pay-per-view. But of course, this would certainly not be the last. And of course, you can't mention bad pay-per-views without talking about NWO sold out in 1997. The idea behind the NWO was to eventually become a second brand in WCW. You wouldn't choose between the WBF and WCW. You'd choose between the WCW and the NWO. So the idea was to eventually give them their own television shows, their own pay-per-views, their own rosters, and so on and so forth. A little ambitious for a, comp- a group at that time who'd only been around about six months, but Eric Bischoff was a forward thinker with uh, maybe a little cocaine in system. I'm not accusing, I'm just saying maybe. So the NWO sold out show was supposed to be that first NWO branded pay-per-view. And they were going to do things different. It was going to be different from WCW pay-per-view. It was going to have a different feel, a different attitude. And then they learned something. Apparently, different doesn't always necessarily mean good. 
They had this weird uh, camera on the outside. It was like a like a fisheye lens on a stick that added nothing. The announcer was clearly NWO because all the WCW guys coming to the ring didn't get music, and they got heckled by the voiceover guy, which I think was Neil Pruitt. I could be could be wrong there, but I think that's who it was. The NWO guys were favored because they had their own masked, clearly Nick Patrick referee. But oddly enough, all the WCW guys won almost all of them. The guys showed up to the showed up to the building in garbage trucks because it's different. I don't know. And there was a Miss NWO contest where theoretically, if you're the bad guys, you're the heels. You're gonna have good-looking women around you, right? Nope, not in their case. They wanted a bunch of like biker chicks and middle-aged housewives. They basically did a beauty pageant in reverse because they were different. The main event, of course, saw the Giant finally get his title shot that he won at World War III against Hulk Hogan, and the match ended on pay-per-view, say it with me, by disqualification. Yes, because the NWO interfered on their own pay-per-view. Yep, that's a thing that happened. The pay-per-view itself, like I said, it wasn't so much, it was a failure on many degrees, but also on a production level. It was completely different, and they were like, oh, it's trying to be different because the NWO, yeah, but it was different in a bad way. It didn't have, it had a different feel, but it was a feel that people didn't like. And that was why the NWO, that was the only one. In the future, they would have WCW, NWO, like, pay-per-views, they'd co-brand them, but the NWO itself would never have a single pay-per-view of their own ever again. And it certainly uh, was part of the problem that sort of stuck a knife into that, creating a separate NWO brand. That and NWO Nitro taking about a half hour to set up while on live television. That didn't help. This That match, the NWO sold out, started in January of 1997. And then we get to Starcade 1997 in December of that year. So this is the end of the year. This is a build of a year and a half storyline between Hulk Hogan and Sting. Hollywood Hogan, my apologies. Now, the show itself wasn't that bad. I mean, there were some good matches on there, so I'm not going to say anything. The big thing they screwed up here, and this is just, again, this is sort of machinations behind the scenes. Uh, the big thing they screwed up here was the most important part. The, ang the angle between Hollywood Hogan and Sting at this point had gone for 18 months. And after a year and a half of buildup, Hulk Hogan beat Sting. Yeah, that's it. After all of this stuff, after this, the Crow Sting came along, after all the beatings and the attacks and all these things, trying to get Hogan... All these setups, trying to get Hogan, trying to get Hogan and Sting, trying to get Hogan and Sting. And they finally do, and then Hogan just beat up Sting for a while, and then pinned him. And that was it. Now, Eric Bischoff, and, and again, I wasn't there. I'm not going to say what behind going on behind the scenes. I wasn't there. But Eric Bischoff's argued in his podcast, and even in his book, that Sting showed up to Starcade, not in that great a shape. He hadn't tanned. And that the proposed finish, which was going to be a callback to Montreal that had happened the month before, was Sting getting screwed, then saved by Bret Hart, then winning the match at, in the end. He thought that was a better plan, which it wasn't. The match itself, like I said, was just Hogan beating the crap out of Sting, and then he got pinned clean. And then Bret showed up and complained about a screw job that didn't happen, which is weird for Bret, because usually he just incessantly complains about a screw job that did happen 20 years ago. And then he restarts the match. And then, then Babyface Sting gets his win. It was like SummerSlam 93 when Lex Luger beat Yokozuna by countout, but everyone went up there and celebrated like he won the title when he didn't. That's pretty much what it was. Everyone came out and they won, but you know what? The real celebration was in August when Lex Luger actually beat Hulk Hogan clean in the middle of the ring with the torture rack and everyone came out and celebrated. This sort of compared to that even fell flat, which didn't matter because Sting, although he won the belt, he was stripped of the title the next night. Then he re-won it in a rematch and basically killed an 18 months of buildup. And then it became just another day in WCW. It's amazing that it's something that 18 months of build got screwed over in one three count. And in a matter of days, they turned it into just another angle in WCW. Wow. In retrospect, that was one of where WCW's flaws became apparent. Sold out was a mistake, but they'd never done that before. It was something completely new. So it's one thing to fail at something you hadn't done before. They could have easily tried again. Uh, this was failing at basic storytelling. I don't care what you think of, of Sting's tan at that point. The point is, it's an 18-month buildup. You have Sting win. And then you do what you do after that. But the, the payoff was for him to win. And the payoff in this case was he won. So this was the thing that should have tipped people off, that WCW wasn't going to last. Because this is basic storytelling. It's one of the only things a wrestling company has to do to survive 
and they screwed up 18 months of build with this one disastrous finish. And of course, you can't talk about wrestling disasters without mentioning Heroes of Wrestling. I'm pretty sure I'm legally required to at this point. Heroes of Wrestling took place in October 10th, 1999 at the Casino Magic Hotel and Casino in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, the hub of all wrestling. It was a brainchild of Bill Stone who wanted to do quarterly pay-per-views showcasing the stars of the best from the 80s and 90s in what he called dream matches, which at the time wrestling was as hot as it's ever going to be, so if there was a time to do that, that would be it. The problem was, it was a guy who didn't know what the hell he was doing, and you'll find out why. Gordon Soley was advertised to announce the event, but fell ill due to throat cancer, something that would eventually take his life, and he was hastily replaced by Randy Rosenblum, who took the job despite the fact that he didn't know anything about wrestling whatsoever. With some amazing things he said like an arm drag, he called a reverse slam takedown, yeah, and a basic drop kick as a flying leg kick, which is, of course, as opposed to a hand kick? It didn't get better throughout the night. The age of the performers, many from the 80s and 90s, was evidence when you consider that only three matches in the entire pay-per-view went longer than 10 minutes. And that includes the main event. And believe me, I will get to the main event. The Bushwhackers vs. Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik, a match that might mid-card a B-Loop house show in 1987, was rated an absolute zero by Dave Meltzer and probably gave someone in the audience cancer. Then there's Jake Roberts. I don't say this with glee. I understand, I'm glad to see Jake Roberts is doing well these days, but you have to remember, this is a recent development, and this was not always the case. This is 1999, so this is during the Beyond the Mat era, where Jake was well into drinking, drugs, and the kind of stuff I'm kind of afraid to even think about. Fittingly, Jake the, Jake the Snake Roberts showed up the event incredibly drunk, and Bill Stone, being the kind of promoter who either didn't know any better or really care, he put him on pay-per-view to do a rambling drunk promo. The worst of his career, yet somehow still better than anything Enzo Amore has ever said. Back here I have a man of legendary proportion, the man Jake the Snake Roberts. He is a man that you all recognize, he's a legend. Come on, Jake, get on in here. The folks want to hear from you. Well, I'll tell you what I You know, you get a casino, and everybody says, well, gosh, a casino, you should gamble. Let me tell you something, Hamble. You don't want to play cards with me because I'll cheat, okay? I cheat. You want to play 21? I got 22. You want to play blackjack? I got two of those too. You want to play aces and eights? Maybe I got too many of those too. Bottom line is this. You do not gamble with me. The only thing you should gamble is this. Listen to me. When you walk in a casino and you want to gamble, the main thing is, you should realize this. To gamble, you must accept losing. I don't accept losing. And neither does Damien. Damien, my friend. My friend Damien is right here. Is she Damien? Yeah, he just stuck his head nice out of him. pile of snake, huh? Oh. You don't want to see this, do you? Well, Let I me don't. show you something. Yeah, that's Let a me show you something. No, I think what, Anvil? Go ahead, Anvil, roll the dice. Mr. Cameraman, get your ass back up here. Hello, I'm talking to you. Get the camera back up here. That is not what you need to worry about, Anvil. The bottom line is this. When the DDT comes, then the snake comes out. Worry about the DDT. DDT. DDT, 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 think about it. A man of his word, Jake the Snake Roberts. Not only did Bill Stone allow a drunken promo, he sent Roberts to the ring to have a drunken match. Classy. Now, in what could only be described as shooting a squirt gun into a burning house, Stone decided to cover for the obviously hammered Jake Roberts by making the main event a tag team match between Jake Roberts and a basically immobile 600 plus pound Yokozuna against Jim Neidhart and King Kong Bundy. When you have to rely on Jim Neidhart and Yokozuna to save your main event, it's time to reconsider your careers. Factory work, subway sandwich artist, become a nurse's aide, anything but pro wrestling promoter. Please. The promoter must have gotten the memo or he was knocked off by the mob or whoever he borrowed the money from because he didn't dare hold another Heroes of Wrestling event. 
and wrestling fans are eternally grateful for that. Rounding off the show, I want to talk about a, a major promotion. A major promotion that, you know, you have a guy like Bill Stone who didn't know what the hell he was doing. He was doing his first wrestling pay-per-view and sort of picked and choose the guys that were take his cash then you have to look at the major promotions to screw up and they should know better of course i mean december to dismember december to dismember was a pay-per-view that was both the death knell of paul Heyman in the wwe for quite a few years and the ecw brand as a whole ecw the brand the third brand of wwe really was sort of limping along they decided they were going to rebrand ecw create a new logo bring in a bunch of new guys and then create a company that is nothing like the original ecw because vince mcmahon and this was really the last time you really saw the whole brand because they decided to make this a wf pay-per-view and not an ecw pay-per-view and believe me there's a big difference they went into the mat they went into the show with announcing two matches the main event, the Extreme Elimination Chamber, which featured basically no actual ECW guys except for the guys that that would be put on the brand, including guys like Big Show and Bobby Lashley. Yeah, he's extreme. There was also the tag team match between the Hardy Boys and Eminem, neither of which team was actually on the ECW brand. It was a good match. There was no reason for it to be on an ECW show other than they decided it. The show would also feature such great matches as Balls Mahoney versus Matt Stryker in a Strikers Rules match. That's right, Balls Mahoney wrestling. That's a good plan. Elijah Burke and Sylvester Turkai. You don't remember them. No one does. No one remembers Turkai and... Some people remember Elijah Burke as the Pope, but, you know, they're TNA fans. They beat the FBI of Little Guido and Tony Mamaluke in under 10 minutes on a pay-per-view. Davari beat Dommy Dreamer in about seven and a half minutes. And then Tommy Dreamer took a dumb bump onto a steel grate because he's Tommy Dreamer and he'll do anything for anyone. Ariel and Kevin Thorne, the wrestling vampires, defeated Kelly Kelly and Mike Knox in a modern classic, I'm sure. And, of course, about uh, less than eight minutes. The main event... Bobby Lashley defeated ECW champion Big Show, CM Punk, Hardcore Holly, Rob Van Dam, and Test. Look at that right there. Tell me that's a main event. In, in I mean, okay, CM Punk was coming up. People liked CM Punk. People cheered CM Punk. But yeah, Rob Van Dam, CM Punk were the two most over guys in the show. Bobby Lashley was the one being pushed by Vic Man. Big Show was on his way out the door. Hardcore Holly and Test, nothing against them, but they were solid performers. I mean, well, Hardcore Holly was, but they weren't. You don't build a franchise around them. You certainly don't build a brand. They were just there. And the thing was, one of them was put in because someone attacked Sabu. So Sabu wasn't even in the match. The Extreme Elimination Chamber did not feature one of the ECW guys. There's one guy in this that was actually an ECW original. One guy who the fans were actually behind, being CM Punk. And then there was a bunch of other guys. One guy's on his on his way out. Bobby Lashley was getting pushed to the moon, but had the charisma of a cardboard cutout of himself. And Hardcore Holly, no disrespect, but he was not a top guy. And Test was even less so. So that was the main event. After this pay-per-view, what made this disastrous? Well, it basically killed the brand. And then, after it was all said and done, that was the night that Vince McMahon put out an announcement that said he had sent Paul Heyman home due to... Uh, ratings being down basically the fallout from the event was this was so awful i've got to fire somebody paul Heyman left now paul Heyman argues that the creative was going to go one way he wanted to put the belt on cm punk looking forward and looking at his track record he's right considering what cm punk would become years later but he was overruled by Stephen mcmahon who decided that Bobby Lashley was the guy to carry the ECW brand to a new millennium. And he held the belt. And he had a feud with Test. Yeah, that one. The whole thing was a disaster from the beginning. First, they didn't promote it well enough to get anyone interested. Second of all, the event itself wasn't that great because they didn't promote it. And then when they put it together, they had matches like Balls Mahoney and Matt Stryker on pay-per-view, which went seven minutes. Oh, dear God. The pay-per-view ended early. Yeah, it ended early. That's how disastrous this pay-per-view was. And while Bobby Lashley would become the face of the brand, the brand itself wasn't long for the world. They would have a couple more champions, they'd change the look of the belt, they'd do what they could, but really, that was the death knell. That was it. That was the end of ECW brand. So if you talk about a disastrous pay-per-view from a, a promotional standpoint, a production standpoint, from an execution standpoint, and from a fallout standpoint, you can't get much more disastrous than December to Dismember. So not only a bad pay-per-view, which it was, but it also was a disaster in the way it affected business going forward. Well, I think I've covered this topic in depth. I know there are other, now there are other bad pay-per-views and there may be other disastrous pay-per-views that I'll get to, but I felt on this episode, I felt like it was a good way to cover. I think the number I covered was, was good. Uh, there are others, I'm sure there, if there are others you're thinking of, ones that you think were just completely disastrous, let me know. If you're on Facebook, put a 
comment below the video if you're listening do whatever get a hold of me somehow just let me know what you think maybe give me some ideas if you, if you have an idea of something i didn't talk about that was as disastrous if not more so because i'm not perfect let me know uh, but until next time my name's dan this exploder have a good one